let us pray loving gracious father we humbly come before you for your grace and mercy father lord as we dwell upon your word for a few minutes we pray that you'll open our hearts to understand to meditate on your word father lord and to abide by it thank you father for this time of worship of this time of learning your word in Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for giving me the opportunity to bring God's word this evening. Jonah's story is one story we might have heard like a million times right from when we were children. And that's one story we are taught in Sunday class all the time. The first story that we tell in right from beginners, that's one story because it catches the imagination of children. Um, it's a big whale, Jonah running, and Jonah coming back, and all those things. Um, but today's passage that we have for today is, uh, the topic for today is common humanity and faith sharing. And um, as we read in the passage, if you kind of look at what Jonah is talking about, I would like to look at Jonah as like one grand conversation between God and Jonah. And God always wants to have conversations with us. It's for us to listen. And if you look at the Bible, uh, we, whenever we look at Nineveh, we always, right from the Bible stories, we read that it's a wicked nation, that all things were bad, and Jonah had to go and rescue them. But if you read in history, it's one of the ancient Assyrian cities and it's in Upper Mesopotamia, and today it's called Mosul in Iraq. And today the city is in ruins, but in the Bible, if you read Jonah, it says Nineveh is one great city. And Jeroboam uh, II was the king during that time, and all famous kings we hear about Sennacherib, who was of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And the city on its own is attributed to a lot of cultural significance. It is supposed to have had a lot of gardens. So ba the gardens of hanging gardens of Babylon is attributed to Nineveh. And it had parks and zoos, and it had a wonderful civilization. This is, this is one part of how you can look at Nineveh, the great city. And also, Jonah is the only book in the Old Testament which talks about revealing God's grace towards the heathen nations. Otherwise, it almost all talks about Israel and Israel's people, the kingdoms of Israel and all of them. And uh, one, there is like kind of a juxtaposition that you can put here is God's choice to show care and compassion to the community of Nineveh. He wants to give them a chance to change as opposed to Jonah's running away, his escaping and his expectant thinking that something bad will happen to Nineveh, and also a feeling of entitlement. So I'll just go into what we have today. If you look at the whole passage, if you read in the earlier chapters of Jonah, you find that common humanity is shared right from the beginning when Jonah runs away and gets into a ship to Tarshish, and then he is in the wind, he's in the storm, and he's caught with all the others. And you find him peacefully sleeping, but all the others are up in a roar, wondering what's happening over there. And you find that at the end of all the conversation that the, soul, the people in the ship, the crewmen and Jonah have it is, they end up worshiping the true God. In spite of Noah, sorry, in spite of Jonah, those people end up worshiping God. He is reluctant in the whole passage. He's reluctant to do what God wants him to do. But then he makes a confession to the folks. He says, I'm responsible for the storm that is here. And then the ship is free now, and Jonah is down in the sea. And when you look at that, he says that at this point, he acknowledges his affliction. And you can see that he almost quotes Psalm 139 when he's cast out into the deep. He says, you have cast me to the deep. You have cast me out of God's sight. The waters have compassed me, depths have closed me, the earth has surrounded him like bars, and he is in the bottoms 
of the mountains, seaweeds wrapping his head, and yet you have lifted me and given me life which is away from corruption. And he cries out, out of affliction, then he makes a sacrifice of praise, and that is when Jonah is spit out, spat out, and he goes to Nineveh. If you actually read the passage right at chapter 3, the story gets over. Because whatever God planned for Nineveh, it finishes over there. God says, I plan all the evil. Jonah goes and preaches, and it stops over there. He says, God relented. God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil, and he had said that he would do unto them, he did not. So rest of the passage that we read today is God talking to Jonah. God takes time. Jonah here is more like a petulant child. How can you do something like this? They are wicked people. They don't belong to you. They don't belong as the children of Israel. Why do you want to go show mercy on them? That is Jonah's response at all through the passage. And it's like he's going extremes. So either he wants to obey God and otherwise he says, best is for me to die. Or sometimes we also do in situations like that. We always choose extremes. Or all these bad things are happening to me, so the best thing for me is to end it or quit it. Or we want to find an immediate end to all those things. But you find Jonah is like, very angry. Why? Because God showed mercy to all the other nations. He chooses Nineveh. If you read the wickedness of Jonah, I mean of Nineveh is only written in Nahum and it also later talks about the destruction that happens to Nineveh. God does punish them but it happens over a period of time. That is they go back to the evil ways just like how Israel keeps following God, going away from God and that keeps happening all the time. And uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah twice. If you read this, words like great city, great fish, great kindness, and the great wind. God uses nature to talk to us, and he keeps on talking to us. He is very active in how he tells us that, yes, I have to show mercy to all the nations. But as Christians, most often we feel we are entitled. Because, like, I don't know whether you have, we always have sung the song, Father Abraham, had many sons, and I am one of them. We take pride in that. Whether we realize it or not, we realize, take a lot of pride in saying, I am one of Abraham's son. And we feel that heritage of whatever belonged to the children of Israel is mine today by faith. But God extends the same mercy that he shows Israel to Nineveh, and we don't like it. So where does our Nineveh lie today? Is our Nineveh far away? But it can be around us. Whatever do we consider in Nineveh? It can be people in our office. It can be people around us in our society, in our community. All across the nation, you will find pockets of Nineveh always around us. And that there will be times when we are, God, we are going to say in our hearts, God, why do they have to be blessed? Why do they have to have all the greatness when I am like this? I am the one being thrown into the fish's belly. I've been there for three days and three nights. Yes, he has been wrapped by weeds. Today, if we go, a seaweed wrap treatments are given, but for Jonah, it wouldn't have been nice that day. But that is why he cries. And that's why for him, it's always an extreme saying that, I don't want any of these things. And, but we always, and he realizes that it is God's choice to show mercy, and it is our choice whether we take up those mercies for us and for those around us. And it's always about unlimited mercy of God for each one of us. And he was displeased, he was angry, he prayed, he went out of the city. If you read Jonah, in third chapter he says, it's the very shortest message that he has to give. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all, it's more like a slogan, straight, nothing, no mercies of God, no love of God, nothing of that. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. We don't know whether he went every day, shouted from some place high enough to tell all these things. But even in spite of that, you find that people repented. The king orders a fasting and prayer for all of them. 
Like even the animals were clothed. That's why when you read in the end of fourth chapter, he says, should I not spare Nineveh, the great city, wherein are more than six score, six crore and thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So God is concerned about everything. He's concerned about humanity. He shows his compassion to the animals, to the cattle that are around us. And once the only thing that we can take away from is how much ever we escape from God, how much ever we find ourselves entitled, how much ever like Jonah we might be extent expecting to see if something bad is going to wrong people, you will find that Jonah had a personal relationship with Christ. That is one of the reasons why he can always fight with God and say he can be angry with God and he can also behave like a petulant child or a very disgruntled person and say, Lord, this is not what you're doing is right. But he can also submit himself to God's will where he can go and preach the word of God. And you find that, to, I will close it up with just a few more things. You find that when he says all these things, it is, we might have our own gods, like we might have also blessings that God is giving us which might not be because of our goodness and everything. But in all these, uh, do we recognize God's tender mercies towards all nations? Our Nineveh might be people around us and every day we face them. We don't have to go far away, we don't have to step out anywhere, but do we acknowledge that God is working in spite of us, but through us? Whether we're like Jonah, we can be, like how he says, he's very displeased that God is doing this. We can be angry, we can be turn away and say, Lord, please take away my life, I don't want to see all these things happening. Whatever said and done, he knew that God is going to work through him, and he did what he had to do. And I would just like to finish off by quoting from Christina Rossetti's poem called Alas, My Lord, a few parts of the verse. Alas, my Lord, how should I wrestle all the live long day and night with thee, my God, my strength and my delight? How can it need so agonized an effort and a strain to make thy face of mercy shine again? How can it need such ringing out of breathless prayer to move thee to thy wanted love when thou art love? Gulped by the fish, as by pit, lost Jonah made his moan, and thou forgavest, waiting to atone. All Nineveh, fasting and girt in sackcloth, raised a cry, which moved thee or the day of grace went by. Lord, give us strength to hold thee fast until we hear thy voice, which thine own know, who hearing it rejoice. So as we close this thing, we pray that Lord will show us way when we can listen to him continuously. And also as we sang in today's song that we just went by, thy world is weary of its pain, of selfish greed and fruitless gain, of tarnished honor falsely strong, and all its ancient deeds of wrong. The wrongs that, or the wickedness of Jonah, I mean, sorry, of Nineveh is all around us. And in spite of all of that, we, can, we worship a God who is great in kindness, who is great in his mercies towards us, even sometimes when we try running away and escaping, and also to all the nations around us. Let's pray. Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this time, for bringing us your word about Jonah, Father Lord. Many a times we are like Jonah. We feel that we are the only ones who are entitled to your love, to your grace and mercy, Father Lord, which many a time we do not deserve. And Lord, we always feel that everyone apart from us belongs to Nineveh, wicked or cruel, filled with unrighteousness, Father Lord. Yet, Lord, you call each one of us to acknowledge that you are a God who wants to change our lives and the lives of those around us, Father Lord. And Lord, that you work through us in spite of us, Father Lord. In spite of all our inadequacies, our weaknesses, Father Lord, our doubtings, our anger, 
our displacements and our lack of vision, Father Lord, because you see the big picture every day, every moment, Father Lord, and your concern over nations is great, Father Lord. We live in a world full of turmoil, but in all this we can trust that you would keep us safe, Father Lord, and that you will enable each one of us to be a part of your kingdom, Father Lord, to bring people to your kingdom, Father Lord. And Lord, even as we brought Daniel here to your presence this day, Father Lord, we pray that he will grow up to a kingdom person, Father Lord, that you will enrich each one of our lives here, Father Lord, that we will be more of kingdom people, Father Lord, and that we will stand high. Yes, Father Lord, we are the children of Abraham, Father Lord, by faith. And Lord, we take pride, we take courage and strength because of that, that Father Lord, because of the faith that is in us, in each and every one of us, Father Lord, to bring our children to you, to bring our families to you, Father Lord, and also as we journey, help us to bring our friends and nations towards you, Father Lord. And Lord, we find ourselves at your grace, at your mercy, Father Lord. Give us the strength to obey your word, Father Lord. Help us to listen to your voice speaking to us as Jonah listened to you when you called out to him twice, Father Lord, and in the fish's belly. Sometimes we might have put ourselves in the fish's belly, Father Lord. But Lord, we pray and we cry out, Father Lord, for all our inadequacies, for our disobediences, Father Lord. Thank you, Father, for your word, which is active today and for the days to come, Father Lord. We humbly commit ourselves once again into your loving hands. We give you all glory and honor. In Christ's most precious name we pray, amen.